Where you can see right now, there's still hundreds of people out here. They have been breaking the windows of the shops here on King Street. Protesters have broken out the window of our Live 5 News car as we were reporting. Here in South Carolina, it's such a diverse state. It's that first in the South that we see a true representation of the rest of the United States. Right now, I'm on one of the buoy boats, and they are actually fixing this buoy like a corridor, basically a wind tunnel. Y recursos relevantes a esta historia en nuestra página web, live5news.com. He is still on the boat right now, but if you look out here on this water right now, you can see how the winds have increased. They've seen an unprecedented request for people to send in their ballots by mail. A new software designed to track and help state agencies notify you. When they go into the ocean, they say they're having worms actually eat through the middle of the wood. This is where the Black Lives Matter protest started at 6 o'clock and still has not ended. You can see behind me that there's still a group of about 10, 15 people here. 100 and 150 cameras like these that are on the houses on the east side. And whoever does really well in this primary could really take that momentum with them into Super Tuesday. Well, I'll be watching. Lillian, thank you very much. Right now, our only two focuses are getting the city together and bridging the gap between the relationship. No justice! No peace! The bridge, both a challenge and a metaphor, as hundreds took to the sidewalk, calling for unity in a tumultuous time. For the first time in a long time, over however many people are here, we're all together. And this is Charleston. George Floyd! The planned protest was one of many in the Low Country this week after the death of George Floyd sparked national outrage. Mount Pleasant police blocked off a lane and walked with protesters. They took time to listen. That's the biggest thing. They actually took time to listen. And those who didn't want to walk helped in their own way, like Yindia Jenkins, who brought food, water, and masks for free. And I bring it to the, the protest. As long as it's a peaceful protest, then they can have whatever they want. Everybody can pitch in. Everybody can help. You can do something, even if you don't want to walk. Like, I'm not going to walk. For those who took to the bridge, the original plan was to stop halfway, but momentum carried the crowd more than five miles. Hundreds of protesters just paused at the top of the Ravenel Bridge here. They took an eight minute pause in honor of George Floyd. Now they're continuing to the end of the bridge. The protest remained peaceful. Like coming together all as one and saying, hey, you know, like, let's attack this illness. Let's say Black Lives Matter. Let's let's say we're not going to tolerate anymore. Let's be anti-racist. The march took about two and a half hours to complete. Reporting in Mount Pleasant, Lillian Donahue, Live 5 News. Crews clean up after a wind whipping morning. Wind is blown out. Taste your breath away. It was blowing and whipping and pretty scary there for a little while. You can see this house behind me has got the roof off. Officials estimate 20 to 30 homes have significant damage after a possible tornado ripped across the island. The damage we're seeing here is similar to some of those I've seen some, from some of the hurricanes we've had. But unlike a hurricane, the storm was concentrated. You'll see a house that's perfect and one that's torn up. And it was just like somebody drew a line to it. It was absolutely amazing, you know. And that line of damage extends from the oceanfront beyond through the golf course behind me, but not before hitting this house first. It has an uprooted tree in the backyard and took off the roof. It just hit about 8.30 this morning, and they were here. Johnny Herndon's father-in-law and his wife, both in their 80s and 90s, were inside. Shock. They rode out the storm in a downstairs room. Their family is still speechless. What do you say in a situation like this? Yeah. It is what it is. Despite the damage, police say no one was injured. Right now, we got to try and get everything going again. We've uh, done door to door on all the damaged houses, so we know there's nobody trapped inside or anything like that. Reporting on Edisto Beach, Lillian Donahue, Live 5 News. They should be letting families know what's going on. And we should not be having to get it from outside sources. Janet Nesbitt lives in North Carolina, but her son is locked up in a prison right here in the Low Country. She called Live 5 Investigates after seeing our story last month about the COVID-19 cases at FCI Williamsburg. I want 
a full report on what's going on with my son. Other families need to know what's going on with their family members and not that they're just okay. The Federal Bureau of Prisons reported 104 confirmed active coronavirus cases on Monday, among the more than 1,300 inmates here. Today, the agency says that active number is down to 38, with 89 inmates recovered. He did end up uh, catching COVID. Marshall Jenkins from Indiana says his father is one of them. We had no clue as the family until he called us on December 22nd and said, hey, I've tested positive for COVID. The local union president, who represents the majority of those who do work at the facility, says that he believes the outbreak actually ramped up after they changed their COVID-19 screening protocols from outside to inside their lobby. They made some changes on the process of what we were doing and being from those changes that allowed COVID to actually walk into the institution. Pinckney says he's working with the medical staff to contain and lower the numbers at the prison. The institutional overall health of our inmate population as well right now, but um, some of the staff are not. Jenkins says there should be more open communication between the facility and families. He is part of that extreme high risk and it, it seems he's getting better now, which is great. Um, but it could have very well taken a very bad turn. But for now, he says the few phone calls from his father are the only way he gets information from inside. Reporting in Williamsburg County, Lillian Donahue, Live 5 News. She touched the hearts of many people. She just was loved everywhere. The family of North Charleston local Jennifer Grant described her as a light to others. They just gravitated towards her because of her spirit, how loving she was, and she was help anyone she could. She was just, she, she just had a heart of gold. But after going missing late last month, they're now learning the gruesome details of how her life was taken. I don't think two human beings should determine the way they, you know, they buried her. Investigators say that sometime in the five days before Thanksgiving, Curtis Smith killed Grant with a kitchen knife during a fight at Smith's home before burying her in his backyard. But court documents say it didn't end there. Instead, the couple outside their home actually dug Grant up put her in a recycling bin. They then wheeled her across this road and over to an abandoned railroad track where they left her body. And took her across the streets and buried her on a railroad track. It's really hard. That's not no respect. Grant's cousin says they are heartbroken and feel she was robbed of a bright future. She just graduated from college and she was working down to the VA hospital. They also said they want more answers about what led to the killing. We do believe there is more than a story being told than what's actually being told to us. Um, we ask that justice definitely be served. But also I ask that you pray for the family. Tonight, only two questions sit on her mom's mind. I would just like to know if she had any last words or did she suffer? Did she call for her mom? Born and raised in the same neighborhood, Grant's family says home will never feel the same with her gone. Reporting in North Charleston, Lillian Donahue, Live 5 News.